Adventure Cyclops, written by Henry Cutman, narrated by Edward E. French. Chapter 4, The Cyclops. It was night before Thorkell gave up the search. Wearily, he pushed open the door of the mud house, put the shotgun on a chair, and dropped the specimen case on the table. They must be dead, he groaned. But, but I must be sure. I must. He polished his spectacles, peering at them vaguely. His watery eyes blinked in puzzlement. Then he went to the door of the radium room and peered through the mica panel. Something he saw there made him turn to the mine yard door. He flung it open, switched on a floodlight, and went out, leaving the door ajar. As soon as he had left, the lid of the specimen case lifted. Three tiny people emerged. Fearfully, they clambered out, crossed the plane of the tabletop, and leaped down to the seat of Thorkell's chair. They gained the floor and went toward the open door. "'He's busy with the windlass,' Mary whispered. "'Hurry!' Stockton halted suddenly. "'Okay,' he said, "'but I've stopped running. You two go on. I'm going to stay and kill Thorkell, somehow.' The others stared at him. "'But Bill,' Mary gasped. It's impossible. If we reach civilization... Stockton laughed bitterly. We've just been fooling ourselves all along. We can never reach civilization. If we launched a boat, we could never get ashore. We'd starve to death or crack up in the rapids. We're imprisoned here, as surely as though we were in jail. We can't get away. If we... The girl began. Stockton cut her short. It's no use. We can't live long enough in the forest. Only luck is saved us so far. If we were savages, Indians perhaps, but we're not. If we go out in the jungle again, it means death. And if we stay here? Baker asked. Stockton's smile was grim. Thorkell will kill us. Unless we murder him first. All right, suppose we manage to kill Thorkell, Mary asked quietly. What then? Then we live. Stockton nodded, a queer look in his eyes. I know. The projector only works one way. We can't regain our normal size, ever. Even if we were large enough to operate the machine. If we could rig up some windlass or lever, it wouldn't help. Thorkell is, I think, the only man in the world who could work out the formula for returning us to our normal size. There's not much chance of his doing that. Baker said slowly, if we kill Thorkell, we'll have to remain like this? Forever? Yeah. And if we don't, he'll get us sooner or later. Well? It's a hard choice, Mary whispered, but at least we'd be alive. Baker nodded and pointed to where Thorkell's discarded gun lay across the chair. It was aimed at the scientist's cot. By God, Stockton grunted, that's it. Having come to a decision, the three acted quickly. They climbed the chair, and using books as props and the scissor blade as a lever, adjusted the shotgun. Sight it at his pillow, Stockton told Baker, who was looking down the gun barrel. Up a little. There. Right at his left ear. Mary was tying a piece of thread to the gun. Can you cock it, Bill? Yeah. He was straining with the lever. Okay. But despite Stockton's apparent assurance, he was feeling slightly sick. The choice was horrible, to die at Thorkell's hands, or else to remain in this world of littleness forever. Thorkell's coming back! There was panic in Mary's voice. The three scurried to cover. Stockton managed to capture the thread's dangling end and ran with it around a box, out of sight. Mary and Baker found shelter beside him. The scientist's shadow fell across the threshold. He entered, yawning wearily. Carelessly, he scaled his hat on a corner and sat down on the cot, unlacing his boots. Stockton's hand tightened on the thread. Would the titan notice the altered position of the shotgun? Thorkell dropped his boots to the floor and started to lie down. Then, struck by a thought, he rose again and went to the cupboard, taking from it a dish of smoked meat and some cassava bread. Placing this on the table, he drew up a chair and began to eat. Apparently his eyes ached. 
Several times he polished his glasses and presently discarded them entirely, substituting another pair which he took from a tray on the table. He ate slowly, nodding with weariness, and at last he removed the new pair of spectacles and slumped down, pillowing his head in his arms. He slept. He slept. "'Damn!' Baker said with heartfelt fury. "'We can't use the gun now. "'We couldn't prop it up at the right angle. "'It looks like the jungle, after all. "'Unless maybe we can use a knife on him.' Stockton looked speculatively at the scissor blade. "'Wouldn't be sure enough. "'We've got to kill him, not disable him.' "'Disable him. That's it,' Mary said suddenly. "'Bill, he's blind without his glasses.' The three stared at each other, new hope springing to life within them. That's it, Stockton approved. We can hide them, and bargain with him, perhaps. We must be quiet, Mary warned. But Thorkell slept heavily. He did not stir when the little people climbed up to the table and, one by one, handed down the spectacles till they could be thrust out of sight through a hole in the floor. That's the last pair, Mary said with satisfaction, peering down into the depths. He won't find them in a hurry. The last but one, Baker denied. Bill, he stopped. Stockton was gone. They saw him back on the tabletop, tiptoeing toward the sleeping Thorkell. He skirted the specimen box and approached the spectacles, gripped in the scientist's huge hand. Gingerly he attempted to disengage them. Thorkell stirred. He mumbled something, and his head lifted, slow with sleep. Fear tightened Stockton's throat. On impulse, he jerked the spectacles from Thorkell's hand and fled behind the specimen box. Blinking, Thorkell felt around for the glasses. His pale eyes stared unseeingly. There was a little thud. Stockton, crouching at the table edge, saw the spectacles hit the floor without breaking. He did not see Thorkell rise and fumble toward the specimen box. Mary's voice was ice-shrill. "'Jump, Bill, jump!' Hastily Stockton slipped over the edge, hung by his hands, and dropped. The floor rushed up to meet him. He landed heavily, but sprang up and fled before Thorkell could see the movement. The scientist said, a curious tremor in his voice, "'So you've come back. So you are here, eh?' There was no answer. Thorkell stumbled to the back door, closed it, and put his back against it. And, for the first time, Thorkell knew fear. Thorkell tugged at his mustache. His voice shook when he spoke. You would dare attack me? Well, that is a mistake. You are shut up in this room, and I will find you. He whirled at a fancied movement or sound, glaring blindly, swinging his bald head from side to side with a slow, jerky motion. I will find you. Stockton pulled Mary back farther into the place of concealment behind a crate. He's crazy with fear. Keep quiet. Thorkell began to stumble around the room, kicking aside apparatus, boxes, clothing. He fell, and when he rose there was blood trickling from the corner of his mouth. His hand closed on the shotgun. He snatched it up and stood silent, waiting. Without warning, Thorkell flung up the gun and fired. The crashing echoes filled the room. Stockton peered out, saw that there was a gaping, splintered hole in the bottom of the back door. Thorkell waited. Then a grim smile twisted his lips. He felt his way to the table and sought for the tray of extra glasses. His hand encountered nothing. The room was utterly still. Then, this is war? Thorkell asked slowly. With a sudden furious motion, he broke down the shotgun and gripped the barrel, holding it like a club. He dropped to his hands and knees and felt beneath the table. Slowly he advanced. In a moment, Stockton realized he would find the glasses where they lay. Stockton's sandaled feet made no sound as he raced forward. Before Thorkell could react, the geologist had sprung beneath his nose, snatched up the glasses, and smashed them against the table leg. Thorkell swung viciously with the gun barrel. Stockton, perforce, dropped the glasses and fled. The huge metal club missed him by inches. He vanished into the shadows. Crouching in their hiding places, the three little people stared, frozen as the titan form of Thorkell rose above the table edge. He was donning his glasses. One lens was splintered and useless. 
blood-stained dirt smeared and terrible, the giant towered there. His voice rose in a shout of laughter. Now, he roared, <laughs> now you can call me Cyclops. Swiftly he strode forward. With methodical haste he began to search the room, overturning boxes, flinging the cot aside to examine some cases beneath it. Stockton made a peremptory signal. Mary and Baker dashed out from their hiding place between Thorkell's discarded boots. They followed Stockton swiftly toward the back door. Outside, quick, he whispered. He can't see us. The cot's in the way. They clambered through the gaping hole the shotgun charge had made. It was not easy, and Mary's clothing caught on a sharp splinter. The cloth ripped as Stockton jerked at it. Footsteps thudded across the floor. The door was flung open. Thorkell switched on the floodlight. His shadow momentarily hid the three as they raced forward. The mouth of the mine shaft loomed up before them. A plank stretched across the pit. Down there, Stockton gasped. It's our only chance. It was the only possible place of concealment. But Thorkell's one good eye did not miss the little people's movements as they scrambled over the brink and down the steep rock of the shaft walls. Skirting the windlass, he fell to his hands and knees and crawled out upon the plank, steadying himself with one hand on the rope that fell down into the black depths. Stockton, clinging to a rock, realized that he still held the scissor-blade sword. He lifted it in futile threat. There was a splintering crack as Thorkell struck at his quarry. The gun barrel crashed on rock, and, abruptly, the plank caved in and dropped. Thorkell still gripped the windlass rope with one hand, and that saved him. For a second he swung wildly, while the echoing crash of the falling wood and the gun barrel echoed up from the depths. Then his grip became surer, panting. He hung there briefly, his bald head gleaming with sweat. He began to climb up the rope. Stockton glanced around quickly. Mary was clinging to a sloping rock, her white face turned toward the giant. Baker was looking at the mineralogist, and his gaunt gray features were twisted with hopeless fury. Stockton made a quick gesture, pointed to his sword, and began to swarm back up to the surface. Instantly, Baker caught his meaning. If the rope to which Thorkell clung could be cut, but it was thick, terribly thick for a tiny man with a scissor blade. Thorkell pulled himself slowly upward. In a moment, Baker saw, he would reach safety. The trader's lips drew back from his teeth in a mirthless grin. He abruptly rose and edged forward a few paces. Then he sprang. Out and down he went, and his clutching hands found Thorkell's collar. Before the scientist could understand what had happened, Baker was clawing and snarling like a terrier at his throat. Thorkell almost lost his grip. Gasping with fear and rage, he shook his head violently, trying to knock his assailant free. You dirty killer! Baker snarled. He was tossed about madly, once almost crushed between Thorkell's chin and chest. And then, suddenly, Thorkell was falling. With a whine and a whir, the windlass ran out as the rope was severed. A long, quavering cry burst from Thorkell's throat as he dropped away into the darkness. Higher and higher it rose and ended. Stockton ran to the brink and peered over. Mary was clambering weakly up toward him, and behind her was Baker. Bill was standing beside an upright book, a curious expression on his face. He looked around vaguely. The machine, he told Mary. Can you work it? Mary was poring over Thorkell's notebooks. She said despondently, It's no good, Bill. The device is only a condenser. It can't bring people back to normal size. We'll have to remain this size the rest of our lives. And now we've got to get back to civilization, somehow. As we are, Baker's face fell. That's impossible. Wait a minute, Stockton interrupted. Of a hunch. Do you remember when we first saw Thorkell? After he reduced us? Yeah, so what? He wasn't trying to kill us then. He just wanted to weigh and measure us. But after he examined Dr. Bullfinch, he turned into a vicious killer. Why do you suppose that happened? 
He probably intended to kill us all along for trying to steal his secrets, Baker suggested. He was probably afraid that we'd warn the Allies of his plans. Maybe. But he wasn't in any hurry at first. He knew he could dispose of us any time he wanted. Only after he examined Dr. Bullfinch, he found out something that made it necessary to get rid of us in a hurry. Mary caught her breath. What? I saw a white mule in the jungle a while ago. A colt. Paco was playing with it. At first I figured it might be Pinto's colt, but mules are sterile, of course. That meant two albino mules here, which isn't very probable. Or else it was Pinto. Remember? Pedro said the dog used to play with the mule. How big was the mule? Baker asked abruptly. The size of a half-grown colt. Listen, Steve, when we first came out of the cellar, I measured myself against that book. Human physiology, it was just higher than my head, but now it only comes up to my chest. We're growing, Mary whispered. That's it? Sure, that's what Thorkell found out when he examined Dr. Bullfinch. And why he tried to kill us before we grew back to normal size. I think it's a progressively accelerated process. In two weeks, or perhaps ten days, we'll be back to normal. It's logical, the girl commented. Once the compressive force of radium power is removed, we expand, slowly but elastically. The electrons swing back to their normal orbits. The energy we absorbed under the ray will be liberated in quantum... Ten days, Baker murmured. And then we can go back down the river again. But it was a month before the three, once more normal size, reached the Andean village that was their first destination. The sight of human beings, no longer gigantic, was warmly reassuring. Indians leaned against the huts, scratching lazily for fleas. Peering down the archway along the street, a ragged Bill Stockton turned to grin at Mary. Looks good, eh? Baker was absorbed in thought. We've got to decide, he said, scratching his stubble cheek. One way, we get our pictures in the paper and tanks of free pulque. But it's just as likely we'll end up in a padded cell if we tell the truth. If we don't tell the truth... He paused, stiffening. A mangy cat had appeared from beyond the arch. Baker's muscles tensed, his breath burst out in an explosive scat as he sprang forward. The cat vanished, shocked to the core. Baker's chest inflated several inches. Well, he said, with the quiet pride of achievement, did either of you see that? No, murmured Stockton, who was seizing the opportunity to kiss Mary. Go away, quietly and quickly. Baker shrugged and followed the cat. A predatory gleam in his eye. The End Dr. Cyclops, written by Henry Cutner, narrated by Edward E. French.